court has effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. And I strongly, strongly disagree with the court's decision. I'm grateful to see the conservative majority that we helped build on the Supreme Court of the United States uh, bring an end uh, to uh, uh, most of affirmative action. And almost a year to the day after the Dobbs decision, they have overturned 40 years of precedent around affirmative action. Hello, I'm Robert Costa in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. A significant day in Washington with the Supreme Court rejecting affirmative action at U.S. colleges. A ruling stated that race-conscious admissions programs, both at Harvard, a private university, and the public university, University of North Carolina, are unconstitutional. And the decision could have reverberations for millions of Americans, as well as for national politics, and prompted an immediate response from the president. I know today's court decision is a severe disappointment to so many people, including me. But we cannot let the decision be a permanent setback for the country. We need to keep an open door of opportunities. For more on this, Nicole Killian and Ed O'Keefe join us. Nicole is a CBS News congressional correspondent. Ed is CBS News' senior White House and political correspondent. Ed, can uh, we begin with you over at the White House? President Biden was just on MSNBC. I'd like to listen to that, especially what he said about packing the Supreme Court and whether Democrats should move forward. Let's listen. It's done more to unravel basic rights and basic decisions than any court in recent history. And uh, that's what I meant by not normal. It's, it's, it's gone out of its way to, I mean, for example, take a look at overruling Roe v. Wade. Take a look at what the decision today. Take a look at how it's, uh, how it's ruled on a number of issues that are, have been precedent for 50, 60 years sometimes. Ed, so that was the president talking about why he used the phrase, this is not a normal court, when asked by a reporter earlier today if the court is a rogue court. He also said in that interview that he doesn't necessarily want to move toward expanding the Supreme Court or packing the Supreme Court, as some Democrats have called for. So it raises the question over at the White House, what next? Well, what next is you can now run against the Supreme Court as currently seated and is currently situated and make the argument that you've got to get a president who's a Democrat and a Democratic Senate back in place after 2024 to ensure that when the next vacancies come up, and there are some expected in the coming years, as certain justices age out, uh, that, that they will be appointed by Democratic justices. But uh, you saw the president today sharply criticize this. The vice president had an appearance in New Orleans as well, making a similar argument that this goes against uh, decades of precedence uh, and is obviously distressing to many in the Democratic Party's base of support. But we should point out, Recent CBS News poll, 53 percent of Americans say that they support affirmative action, but just 30 percent say on the issue of college race-based admissions programs, only 30 percent of Americans support doing so. So the White House today, in laying out sort of how it goes forward, laid out a, a series of suggestions to colleges and universities that they could adopt that, in essence, is, you know, keep to what the Supreme Court was suggesting, that race can be a factor but cannot be a factor the way it was at Harvard and the University of North Carolina, in that you take it as part of a holistic look at an applicant's life experience, what they maybe overcame to get to the point where they can apply to that college, and, oh, by the way, what, what is their race? The way Harvard had done it, it was, you know, people who were eligible to apply applied, and then reviewers looked at a series of things, your grades, uh, other life experiences, and then what race are you? And that was where the Supreme Court was saying you can't do that anymore. So the president today saying, look, it should continue to be something colleges and universities think about, um, and it has to be something that Democrats, of course, push for. And we will see this White House, and certainly congressional Democrats say, it's why you got to keep Democrats in charge of Congress should Supreme Court vacancies come up. So that's one response, is to make a push and to make recommendations. But what about on policy, Nicole? Take us inside Capitol Hill and the possible response there in terms of legislation and anything else? Yeah, well, that is the question. Obviously, as you know, Congress is out on a two-week recess for the July 4th holiday, so there's not really much they can do in the short term. Uh, but certainly, as far as Democrats are concerned, it is something that they're starting to discuss amongst our, themselves. Of course, we heard earlier today from the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Stephen Horsford. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. I truly condemn uh, the decision by the majority uh, 
conservative members of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, they have rolled back 45 years of precedent uh, in taking race uh, conscious preference into uh, consideration as one uh, of many factors in accepting a student. Now, he really, as far as reforms, just kind of pointed to the Senate saying, well, maybe Leader Schumer can look at some uh, potential reforms there. But I did just get off of call with members of the Congressional Black Caucus, members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and uh, members of KPAC, which represents uh, those AAPI lawmakers. And so they did want to present a united front, and they did talk about some other uh, mechanisms. One thing that was interesting is that uh, Congressman Bobby Scott, who's a ranking member on the House Education and Workforce Committee, said, you know, this is going to be tricky. It's going to be tough because there's really no, you know, the Supreme Court didn't strike down a statutory decision. So trying to make a statutory fix really isn't possible for Congress. And so some of the things they talked about, for instance, is really holding the attorney general uh, to account, for instance, to make sure that if there are cases where there is discrimination, to make sure that those are challenged, to make sure that there continues to be outreach to underserved communities, whether that's through the Department of Education, making sure, holding, you know, these colleges and universities their feet to the fire to make sure that they are still making uh, those steps and making those inroads uh, with communities of color. Uh, one thing that they also brought up, uh, which I thought was interesting, which we've heard a lot today, is this notion of ending legacy-based admissions. You know, many Democrats arguing, well, how is it fair to strike down a decision like this, but yet stand policies where people whose parents have gone to a college or university or who are major donors to a university, those folks can still get in in significant percentages. So whether or not Congress can address that part of the equation, I think, remains to be seen. But those are some of the ideas that at least some congressional Democrats are kicking around. Let's go back to the White House and listen to what Vice President Harris had to say today. The disappointment is because this is now a moment where the court has not fully understand the importance of equal opportunity for the people of our country. Ed, when you're talking to your sources inside the White House, how are they evaluating the dissents by Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson? How are they looking at the arguments laid out by the more liberal side of the court as they formulate their own rhetoric and message for the future? Well, clearly on her flight to New Orleans, the vice president read the Jackson dissent uh, because she was citing it in that event there in New Orleans uh, at the Essence, Fence, uh, Essence Fest uh, and, and said it should be read closely by those who are concerned about what happened today. Um, th this is a White House that we know right after the ruling this morning was announced, uh, had the president, uh, the White House counsel and other aides closely reading through not only the full opinion, but the dissents, including what Justice Jackson wrote, uh, to get a better sense, especially and most immediately, of whether this was something that just applied narrowly to colleges and universities or had the potential to have affected affirmative action writ large across society. Uh, generally, it looks like it was more related to just education issues, uh, but there is, of course, concern that one day soon other cases could be brought that chip away further at affirmative action, which, as the president called out, has, has been in place for more than 40 years. So, uh, yes, they, they, they are certainly aware of and embracing what Justice Jackson said. Ed, uh, of course, she was put on the court by the president. Ed, uh, speaking of bracing, it's only Thursday. What's the White House bracing for now in terms of uh, the upcoming student loans decision? Yeah, that is the other one they've been preparing for. And we know that the Education Department and the White House have been basically playing out the various legal scenarios and then how they could respond through executive action or clarifications to schools across the country. In the case of the Student Loan Forgiveness Program, remember, this was put in place last year. The president himself had expressed reservations about doing this, concerned about the legality of it, but went with it because, of course, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party was pushing him to do it, even though he was pushing Congress to do it. So tomorrow, once this ruling comes down, look for them uh, to provide clarification on what would be next should the program get struck down, although the White House has been pretty confident publicly and privately in our conversations with them that they believe those that brought the suit don't necessarily have standing to do so, and so at least part of it may ultimately survive. We'll see, because we've seen in a few different cases brought by either Republican state governments or conservative organizations 
in recent days that the Supreme Court has been calling them out for not having legal right to sue. Uh, in this case, the White House is arguing they believe that state governments that did so, the Republican-backed ones, might not have total standing to have looked into it. But they're ready for it. And that is a change also, we should point out, from last year when, of course, remember, the Dobbs decision came down and abortion rights were struck. The White House was faulted for appearing to be flat-footed and caught off guard and for taking several days, if not weeks, to really come up with a response, both in a policy and political way. Mm -hmm. This time, we know they've been preparing for weeks on both ends, uh, anticipating these rulings, knowing that they have a big effect on the base of the Democratic Party, minorities, right. college students, uh, and, and people who you know may live paycheck to paycheck. Nicole Killian, Ed O'Keefe, thank you so much. Good. Democrats have been quick to criticize today's ruling. Up next, I'll speak to House Minority Whip Catherine Clark. You're streaming America Decides. Discrimination still exists in America. Today's decision does not change that. You're doing a ter terrible disservice to the future leaders of this country in a multiracial, multiethnic democracy. This is a dark day for democracy and for equality. And to make the presumption that today, in 2023, that our country is colorblind is incorrect. Welcome back to America Decides. That was some of the reaction we heard today from Democrats following the Supreme Court's decision. Massachusetts Democratic Congresswoman and House Minority Whip Catherine Clark joins us now. Congresswoman, thanks for being here. Good to be with you, Bob. Thanks for having me. So one of your main jobs in Washington is to keep tabs on your House Democratic colleagues to understand how they're responding to the key issues in the country. How are they responding today to this court decision on affirmative action? I think my colleagues, just like the American people, are disturbed by today's ruling because they understand that diversity is a strength. And that's true in our universities and colleges, in the workplace, our military, and even in the halls of Congress. So today's ruling is taking us backwards. And it continues a legitimacy crisis with the Supreme Court, where every single one of those justices during their confirmation hearings said they would uphold precedent. Yet once again, almost a year to the day after the Dobbs decision, they have overturned 40 years of precedent around affirmative action. What kind of changes, if any, do you believe should be made to the Supreme Court? Should it be expanded, reformed in any way? You know, our caucus is evaluating the Supreme Court and looking at various solutions to help address this crisis that we're seeing. Some of the proposals are expanding the ethics uh, standards that apply to every other federal judge, but not to the nine Supreme Court justices. Looking at term limits, a possible another expansion of the court, as we've done in the past. All of these things will be discussed within our caucus caucus as we continue to make sure that the American people have a legitimate court that they can have faith in. And right now, that faith is being tested. So what does this mean, potentially, politically? I remember after Roe v. Wade was overturned ahead of the 2022 midterm election, so many Democrats I encountered on the campaign trail said that this issue, in their view, would galvanize Democratic voters, would bring them to the polls. Do you believe that ahead of 2024, this ruling on affirmative action will have the same sort of effect on galvanizing Democrats, or do you see it in a different way? You know, very much like the Dobbs decision, that decision said, we are taking away rights. We are taking away a constitutional right when we overturned, uh, when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. They said, we're rolling back for the first time in our country's history a fundamental freedom. And the American people understand that that is against our country's best interests. It is against the decision making of their own families. And every single race comes down to one principle Are you fighting for me? And Democrats have shown time and time again that we are fighting for the American people. But the MAGA GOP is not.
the American people are not even in the work or the focus of what they're doing. So we're going to continue to fight for the freedom for reproductive justice, affirmative action. We are going to fight for economic opportunity to make sure that everyone, no matter their zip code, can participate in our economy as we do our work to grow the middle class and continue to lower costs, make a tax system that is fair, fight for climate security mm -hmm. and build climate resilience while we create good jobs. And the Biden economics is working for the American people. And that's the message that we're going to run on in 24. And it is one that resonates. Going back to the decision announced today, what is your view of Chief Justice John Roberts in his opinion, writing for the majority, where he said that while race conscious based admissions will no longer be deemed constitutional by the Supreme Court, a student's story that could include how they've dealt with race or adversity can be part of the admissions process. How do you believe this is going to play out in the real world for your constituents and for others? Yeah, I think this is a dangerous moment for my constituents. And I represent one of the one of the defendants in this very case. Uh, Harvard is in my district, as well as many other colleges. And what they want to do is have a diverse student body and address what we know are racial disparities that permeate throughout our country and throughout our society. And so what this decision is saying and what the Roberts Court said was we are now somehow post-racial in a colorblind country. And we know that's not the truth. And I think that we can look to the warnings that Justice Sotomayor gave in her dissent, that we still need to be fighting for equality. And what we're seeing in a mag GOP is that it's not even just affirmative action, but they're going after African American history and banning curriculum, that they are targeting corporations that are embracing diversity and equality in their corporate policies. There is an all out attack on trans communities in this country. And so they are moving in a very extreme way against equality. And it's why, excuse me, it's why it's so important that we continue to put the American people and what they need, their opportunities, their freedoms, right to control their own mm -hmm. bodies, their own economic destiny at the center of the work that we're doing. And that's exactly what we did when we had the majority. And that is why we are going to win the majority back in 2024. Well, we have more than a year until November 2024, but it's certainly going to be not only a legal battle, but a political battle. Congresswoman Clark from Massachusetts, the House Minority Whip, one of the leaders of the Democrats in the House, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bob. President Biden laid out his economic agenda this week, a major part of his reelection push. I'll speak to one of the president's top economic advisors next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. President Biden has been addressing his economic agenda this week. Recent CBS News polling shows a partisan split on the president's handling of the economy. But 69 percent of independents disapprove of Biden's approach. And ahead of 2024, the president is under pressure to win back their support. The chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, Jared Bernstein, joins us now. Jared, thanks for being here. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Jared, I spent a lot of time on the campaign trail talking to voters. Some of them are skeptical that manufacturing jobs are going to come back to places like the industrial Midwest. But the Biden administration seems to have confidence in manufacturing in the U.S. What's your message to those voters who don't feel like those jobs might have any chance of coming back to their town? Uh, we have great confidence in that prospect, and it's a confidence not built on uh, just hope. It's a confidence built on the empirical experience of Bidenomics. 
not only investing in public goods, very important, our ports, our bridges, our roads, our airports, uh, our water systems, but pulling in private investment uh, to invest in standing up a domestic semiconductor industry, batteries, electric vehicles, clean energy products, and not just on the coasts, but in rural areas, in, uh, in upstate New York, in Ohio, in Oklahoma. We have active hundreds of billions of dollars of private capital committed to tapping the incentives in the, uh, in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, in the Inflation Reduction Act, and in the CHIPS Act to do precisely that. And that's in the wake of 800,000 manufacturing jobs on this president's watch. Many administration officials over the past year have worried about the war in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia, and what that can mean for the global economy. There's always the factor of China and other issues on the world stage. What concerns you? I know you've expressed a lot of confidence this week, so has the president. But what is a challenge that looms on the horizon for this agenda? Well, if you think about some of the key global commodities that are priced on global markets that are so important to uh, American consumers, but consumers the world over, certainly energy and food come to mind. And here I have two very important uh, things to tell you, one of which is a calculation I was just doing before I came out here. If you look at the price of gas, it shot up to over $5 a gallon about a year ago, right on the heels of, uh, of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Last seen, uh, the average price now is, I think, $3.55 a gallon. So that's, that's a, a nice reversal there. Now, if you actually look at how much an hour, at the same time, wages have been going up. So if you look at how much an hour of work gets you at the tank, a year ago, it got you five and a half gallons. Today, it gets you eight gallons, okay? So that's a 50% increase in the amount of gas you can buy given your paycheck. So it's a combination of rising wages and falling gas prices. Groceries uh, have come down uh, over the past three months uh, by about half a percent in terms of not the inflation, their actual prices. So, you know, the price of eggs is basically back to where it was a year ago. We've got more work to do in that space, Bob, but we're making progress. When you talk about more work to do and beyond gasoline and groceries, what are some concrete markers Americans can look to in terms of inflation coming down that's indicative of progress or a lack of progress in the coming year? Well, I think, first of all, we need to continue to build on this trend where year-over-year -year inflation is down for 11 months in a row. Of course, it peaked at over 9 percent, last seen at 4 percent. Now, that's still too elevated, and we need to keep working to keep moving that trend in the right direction. I told you about some of the movements in energy prices in the price of groceries. But in Bidenomics, you know, Pillar 3 is promoting more competition to lower costs for consumers. So people should watch prescription drug costs. They should watch the cost of insulin. They should watch uh, the cost of clean energy. And they should uh, notice the work that we've done on junk fees, to get junk fees out of the system and to take down overdraft fees, uh, saving consumers $5.5 billion a year. So many people, when I'm out there again on the campaign trail, are talking about the issue of housing. And they wonder, can they afford a home? Inflation is making them recalculate their entire budget as a family or a household. Yeah. What can you offer to them uh, in terms of anything constructive that's going to happen on the White House policy side on housing in the coming months? In this White House, housing policy is housing supply. Ever since we've gotten here, this is not a cyclical, meaning a, uh, a time-limited uh, kind of a of a problem we've identified. This is structural, meaning it's decades old. It doesn't just go up and down with the business cycle. We have an insufficient supply of affordable housing, and this president has policies in his budget to reverse that. Now, look, we know that we live in a very partisan environment, so we've got to do more than put things in our budget. We're going to fight for those things. The chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, Jared Bernstein, thank you. Thank you, Bob. That does it for today. You can stream America Decides Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News.